My name is Rastin Wu. Our time is limited, and so I'm going to try to keep my introductory remarks pretty short. Um, I've been asked to uh, moderate some public engagement around this 1871 memorial project. Um, so for those of you who don't know, um, on October 24th, 1871, about a decade before the passage of the Chinese Exclusion Act, a mob of Angelinos murdered at least 18 people, roughly 10% of the city's Chinese population. This was the largest mass killing in the history of Los Angeles. And for many people, when they hear of the 1871 massacre, they are quite surprised that they had not heard of it before. And this project, the Memorial to the Victims of the Chinese Massacre of 1871, seeks to redress that and to simultaneously raise public awareness of that event and address contemporary concerns about race, intolerance, and violence. Um, a lot of people have been working on this for quite some time, um, many of whom are on this Zoom right now. We have David Louie, Lisa C., Michael Wu, Gay Yuan, Felicia Filer, and Christopher Hawthorne from the mayor's office, um, and many, many, many more. Um, in 2021, after the mayor's report on civic memory came out and after the tragic murders in Atlanta, there was a new urgency and the city uh, devoted resources to making this monument a reality. Um, there was an ideas competition that received hundreds of entries and last month, six shortlisted teams released their designs to the public and three of those teams will now be presenting um, at this session. There'll be three more presenting at 2 p.m. Um, and afterwards, we'll have some conversation. Um, the teams will take those, what they hear from those conversations and revise their proposals for their final submission. And the winning team will work with the city um, to create a final design. So a quick word about the format. Um, we're gonna hear from three of the six teams right now. Each of them will speak for about 20 minutes. As folks are speaking, please feel free to post questions to the chat. I'm gonna add um, in the chat a, a mural board that you can also uh, attach notes to. Um, and then after the presentations, I'll ask a few moderated questions, um, just a few, um, give each team a time to respond, and then we'll be scattered into breakout groups where we have, um, we'll have a uh, kind of intimate conversation. And um, I guess one thing to note is if you have a language desire, um, you'd like to be placed in a, a breakout group with other people speaking a particular language, please uh, put that in the chat so I can know to assign people in, in the correct way. Um, otherwise, I think the groups will more or less be assigned um, at, at random. <laughs> um, so there'll be designers mixed in um, in those groups and really take those as, as an opportunity to have conversation. Then we'll convene for the last five minutes and say our farewells. So before, um, without any further ado, um, as we're a little bit behind time, um, I'd like to invent, invite the, uh, the first team to present. Um, so that's uh, Sonam Lamao, Jiwei Yao, and Yi Ying. Um, please take it away. Mm, hi, everyone. Welcome to join our presentation today. And my name is Sonan Lamo. Uh, I was born and raised in Tibet, where mm -hmm. I speak fluent Chinese. And those uh, Jawi and Yi and my, room, uh, my, my teammates, we did our graduate school together. So, oh, and welcome to jump in at any time during our presentation. Mm, the the name of our proposal is Bridge Sanctuary. And Ian will get us started. So before we start to talk about our concept, let's take a look at this aerial picture of the site together. I believe everyone in this meeting today is very familiar with the area we are looking at right now. When we look at this site for the first time, the first thing we noticed was those main roads wrapping around the building block where Chinese American Museum is located at. Actually, two primary sites were proposed by the city and we chose primary site two for our design. As you can see, the primary site we choose includes part of the North Los Angeles Street. One of the biggest challenge was how to utilize the part of the road while not blocking the traffic. Apparently, an easy answer would be to design a structure goes above the road, right? Like an arch or a gateway. But do we really want to do that? Not really. First, we don't want to sacrifice the already limited sidewalk space 
for the foundation of a massive structure. Secondly, it would be such a shame if we build something really tall that will eventually block the elevation of the Chinese American Museum. So what we can do here is to utilize the road with the least disturbance of the site. And what would be the least introversive way to put a mark on North An Los Angeles Road and let it tell the story that we want to tell? Those are the first two questions we ask ourselves and lead us to dig more into the site. We found our answers after we did a research and we realized that the Overall Street and El Pueblo actually have great spatial quality. For us, those are spaces we would like to create in our city. Those spaces have warm and welcoming atmosphere that accommodates both residences and visitors very well. We want to carry the spirit of those spaces and to apply it to our site. Let's first look at the elevation of the Chinese American Museum and the street corner on the left. With the similar material as Oral Street and El Pueblo, the museum itself has an amazing elevation as part of the scene. But because of the main road running in front of the museum, the sidewalk space in front of the museum was put at a very awkward spot. The other reason why this sidewalk space doesn't have good spatial quality like Oriel Street and El Pueblo is because of the scale. So looking at the historic picture on the right side, I want everyone to think about a question. This is a good picture, right? You can feel the vibrance as well as the intimacy of the community. But what makes you feel so vibrant and intimate? An important fact is scale. The alley itself is not that wide, and those various canopies add more layers and make the whole space human scale and more approachable. So, to make our site a public space that people will actually enjoy, the first we need to do is to restore human scale. We have to break down the scale here as long as we can introduce human scale to our site. The space will automatically feel more intimate. Sometimes the only thing we need might just be one or two steps of stairs, and it will make a huge difference to the space. Now, we have talked about the two reasons why we think, given the great elevation as the background with nice street trees, the quality of the sidewalk space is still undermined. Uh, so uh, next slide, please. So at here, we will look at how we can try to solve the problems we found. The first thought was trying to carry the existing building language and apply it to our site. If we look at the mapping here, it's showing our initial thought clearly that we are trying to create another small quality space for people to stay. Walking along the Oval Street and El Pueblo, we want to create a nice sequence of spatial experience. Looking at the mapping, you can see how every block is becoming an isolated island in the city, separated by all of those busy roads. Here, we are trying to create a subversion of the bridge to connect the isolated urban space and bring human interaction to the site. So instead of building any structure that above the road, we simply modified the material of the road to create a bridge. So the first thing we did here was to carry along the existing material palette of the site. And by replacing the asphalt road with the red bricks, people will be able to sense the uniqueness of the space from far away, or even when they're just driving through the site. Everyone that drives might know how it feels when you're driving on brake roads, right? Like you will immediately feel the difference. So with this simple move, 
we hope it will draw people's attention to the site and the project. And the next move is on the sidewalk. So by redesigning the sidewalk space and create a linear space with multiple infrastructure that becomes a layer between the North, Angel uh, North Los Angeles Road and the museum, we were able to blur and soft that boundary, also pr provide a sheltered space, a sanctuary to protect people from the busy traffic. And according to a research by UC Berkeley, 81% of US metropolitan regions with at least 200,000 residents were more segregated in 2019 than they were in 1990. And the Los Angeles metropolitan area remains the sixth most segregated of the 221 metro areas. Also, according to the author, Residential segregation is the undercurrent of basically every expression of structural racism in this country, from health disparities to overplacing. It is undeniable that racism and racial segregation are chronic pains of large Los Angeles, but the situation now is even worse, especially in the post-pandemic era with anti-Asian crimes increasing nationwide. The situation for all the Chinese American is even harder now. So the facts above make it such a critical point for us to commemorate the massacre in the history of Los Angeles. I also want every of us to think about this. Does discrimination lead to the segregation or segregation leads to more se severe discrimination? I think it's a, a tricky question for me, but I do know to solve the problem, one thing we have to do is to bring people together. Conversation is much needed. I know people talk every day, everyone says a lot of things every day, but think about real conversations. How often do you feel you're having real conversations? Humans are so complicated that we often hide, manipulate, twist, and misunderstand our own feelings, as well as others, without even realizing it. Just because of that, conversations are even more important to us. That's one of the maybe not many ways that we as human beings have that makes it possible for us to communicate, to understand, to feel, to correct, and to fix things. That's what we are trying to do here. We want to bring people together and create space for all sorts of conversations to happen. Physically, we're trying to create a bridge to connect the urban enclaves and this space will also be a bridge between people of different races with different backgrounds and those who speak different languages. Initially, we rejected the idea of making a, a sculpture or a, a nice object as a memorial, because for us, it doesn't really convey much information. For us, a good memorial should not only be able to tell the, the story of the past. Most importantly, it has to be able to engage in the present and connect the future. It is also the reason why we started the concept by analyzing the, the site information. It doesn't make much sense for us to design something that can be put in any other city around the world or any other place in LA, right? We want this memorial to be rooted in LA Chinatown. In order to activate the site and make a space for public gathering and introspection, we decided to take on the approach of creating an everyday thing that plays the role of the memorial by a relatively restrained approach. We are willing to make the site a place of reverence, communication, and healing. Compared to a conspicuous monumental structure that might bring active spatial experience, we choose to make it something humble. Ideally, the memorial will create a space for everyone passing by to stay or simply go through instead of creating an object 
we try to create a location and the movements. By making the form less monumental, we created a series of infrastructures here for some possible activities that could happen in a public space in response to the site, also to the massacre itself. I think here would be a good point to have a brief summary of uh, we have talked about before. Think about the non-human skill building facade and the originally empty sidewalk, also the busy traffic running beside it. Now, what we have here is a human skill space that broke down the scale of the site, also keeps you away from the traffic. And it creates a series of structures for possible activities. Even just several stair, stair steps there, they will definitely make a difference. So when people passing by sit there or even just lean on the handrail, you will know the difference. So remembering when we talk about, we don't want to design an object or a sculpture, right? So instead of an object, we will want to create a space that engages in the community. Looking at this perspective, as you will understand what I mean. We're on a sidewalk. It is a place that meant to be for the transition or circulation. People just pass by or drive by. An object here is not enough to draw their attention and make them stop. The solution is to create a location. Yes, creating a location at a place that means to be for the transition and let people slow down and stay. When people slow down, there will be interactions. There will be conversations. People of different races, religions, genders, or who speak different languages will share a moment under the trees, sitting together, have a good conversation and taking a peek at the unsolved problem of the city. And people also can scan the QR codes attached to the memorial to have a virtual tour of Los Angeles in the 19th century and get detailed information about the massacre. We also designed emergency call buttons for people to use, which will contact the closest police station. Furthermore, People will utilize this space to protest, to, to celebrate festivals, to have community meetings about the future of the city. Like we're trying to create a memorial space and a moment with the absence of a monumental form. For us, the, the memorial would be more meaningful when it's really utilized by not only tourists, but also people living in this city, this neighborhood. A place that can make people passing by slow down, take a look around and sit there to enjoy the moment and talk to people. That's something the city really needs. You know, maybe, maybe five minutes later, they will just decide, oh, we should have lunch here every day. Okay, and let's go more detail here. And by, by using three different structural components, uh, brick, wood, and metal, we try to create a metaphor of an immigrant society. First, as a response to the facade of the Chinese American Museum and the neighborhood, right bricks are used as the base structure, which also plays the role of the natives in the city. Lightweight wood components are immigrants and who are standing on the foundation created by the natives. <clears throat> and two types of metal structural components are designed for both compression and tension. Wood structure then sitting on bricks will be stable only when the metal structure and the joints get a perfect balance between the compression and tension. It's a metaphor of the immigrant society as well. It's never an easy thing to fit in or to accept new people and new cultures that are strange to you but we have to keep trying. Those metal strings and joints are people's efforts that's keeping the brick wood system balanced. And at the same time, uh, these new and Angelinos are working together to accommodate people in this city to have a, a conversation here. And you probably have also noticed that all the columns use the, the hinge joints. So they have to work with tension together to keep the whole structure work. That's also what we are trying to convey. 
everyone in, in our society uh, deserves to be uh, treated equally. And each of you should be proud of who you are, where you are from, as well as your contribution to your community and the society. Everyone plays their particular irreplaceable role. So whenever you get the chance, tell your story, be upright, be prompt, and do whatever you can to start a conversation to change the narrative. As the designer, we also want to say sex, uh, thanks to all the immigrants. It is their tireless hard work and the resilience that makes the city home to their offsprings as well as later Chinese immigrants following their steps, just like three of us. And uh, we also developed uh, different types of modular prototypes that can be assembled and applied accordingly to every secondary site, depending on the different site situation. And we hope more and more pieces like this will emerge in the city and make Los Angeles a more workable and diverse city. And it also contributes to the reason why we choose primary site two for our design, because instead of an insulated, uh, insulated point, we would want to design a series of points that creates a linear sequence as well as a, a continuous spatial uh, experience. And uh, it's the very end of our presentation. Uh, we would like to uh, share a quote from the book, uh, in Enlightenment Now, The Case for Reason, Science, Humanism, and Progress by Steven Pinker with you. It perfectly aligns with what we try to convey through our proposal. And the quote is here, uh, what is progress? You might think that the question is so subjective and culturally uh, relative as to be forever unanswerable. In fact, it's one of the easier questions to answer. Most people agree that life is better than death, health is better than sickness, uh, sustenance is better than hunger, abundance is better than poverty, peace is better than war, safety is better than danger, freedom is better than tyranny. Equal rights are better than uh, bigotry and discrimination. Literacy is better than illiteracy. Knowledge is better than ignorance. And intelligence is better than dull witness. Happiness is better than misery. Opportunities to enjoy family, friends, culture, and nature are better than drudgery and the monotony. All these things can be married if they have increased over time, that is progress. And thank you all, thanks for your time, thanks for listening, that's our proposal. Thanks everyone. Thank you so much, and apologies for that disruption. Um, so now we're gonna continue with another presentation, um, this time from the team, uh, Tse Tseng, Nicholas Leung, and Judy Chuihua Chung. Um, are you all ready to share? Yes, we are, and thanks, uh, Rostin. Yes, thanks. Okay. Um, so, hello, everyone. I'm Si Chung Nicholas Leong. And I'm Judy Suha Chung, and we're both very honored to be here to be able to present our proposal to all of you and to be among such talented finalists. We'd like to thank everyone, all the institutions, committees, and individuals who made this memorial and this moment possible. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll start by saying that I'm an artist and Judy's a writer, and we've been collaborating for many years on books and exhibitions, and also architecture at the beginning. Our work, uh, Nicholas's in photography and painting, and mine in writing and editing, share an interest in how histories, whether cultural, personal, erased, or unknown, affect landscape. This shared interest was the foundation for our collaboration on our memorial proposal from the historical research to the concept, to the design and site planning. So now we'll, uh, we'll share our screen. So we'll introduce our project by speaking about our goals for our design. Our first goal was to help people understand this tragic event, both in itself and in the context of Asian American history. The massacre was one instance in a larger history of exclusions, purges, killings, and legislations that were all efforts to prevent particular groups of people from setting down roots in this country. Within this difficult history, though, is also a history of triumphs, innovations, and contributions. 
All of these histories, unfortunately, have been mostly ignored and even erased, and often are completely surprising to people. Yet they laid the ground on which we as Asian Americans have built our diverse identities. It's why historical research and finding a way to show this history in our design played a central role in our proposal. We wanted the memorial to help bring visibility and public consciousness to these histories with poignancy and dignity. Our second goal was to show solidarity and alliance with the wide mixture of peoples, cultures, and environments that form the very identity of Los Angeles. The cultures of the early Chinatowns were largely formed by the Cantonese, particularly those from Seiya, the region from which most of the 19th century emigrants came from, including the transcontinental railroad, railroad workers and the massacre victims. In Southern California, the Cantonese culture became intertwined with the region's many cultures and histories, including indigenous, Mexican, African, Filipino, and Japanese American, and ecological. All are connected, and unfortunately, one of the ways they are linked is through a history of uprooting and being denied the opportunities to establish roots here. Showing solidarity is, is extremely important to us. We were very struck by listening to the late Tongva elder, Julia Bogany, who said that the most effective way to support the Tongva is to become an ally by, quote, knowing who you are, your history, where you came from, because that gives you the power to respect other people, end quote. This dialogue between cultures is deeply felt by both of us. As I'm Mexican born of Cantonese Seiyap and Samya, as well as Hokkien ancestry while Judy is of Taiwanese ancestry, both Hokkien and indigenous. In one of my recent projects, I researched the indigenous history of Seiya and was amazed and saddened to see parallels with Native American history. The same is true in Taiwanese history. Our third goal was to propose a memorial that is open and inclusive in that it's both culturally specific and speaks to shared experiences that it's both abstract and representational, traditional and contemporary. We wanted a design that works both as individual pieces and as a collective whole, a dispersed yet connected memorial that occupies an expanded landscape. Essentially, we wanted to create an iconography that is Asian American, an acknowledgement of the importance of creating our own culture and writing our own narrative, which for too long had been created and written by others, often through the lenses of Orientalism, exoticism, and foreignness. We want to show that we're part of this landscape, and it's why we've chosen the imagery of trees and roots, and their history of meanings related to belonging. We're thinking, for example, of the expression putting down roots, and the influential 1971 book Roots, an Asian American Reader, and also the recent Roots exhibition at the Chinese American Museum. In Mexico, there's the expression la cuarta raíz, the fourth root for the Asian ancestries that are part of the foundation of the Mexican people. In addition to symbolizing belonging, roots also implied buried histories, unseen but still there, which form the ground under our feet. Even when a root rises above ground, we know it's still attached to a network below ground. And it's the sense of connection that we wish to evoke in linking all the sites of the memorial and the many layered histories of this land. So now we'll take you through our projects. The starting point for our design begins in the villages of Seya. In 2018, I visited this region to look into the history of my grandfather and my ancestry, and to make photographs of the culture's particular relationship to buildings and banyan trees. This image is of my grandfather's village in Toisan. Banyan trees are revered in Seya, a practice that I believe has persisted from the region's indigenous Ute cultures. Each village is watched over by an expansive banyan, which embodies protective spirits and vital energy, symbolizes life, resurrection, and survival, expresses a connection with the land, and provides a place of refuge for praying, celebrating, gathering, and sharing under its wide leafy canopy. It's this relationship between human use, markers, and trees, particularly the spaces of refuge under leafy canopies, that we wanted to bring into our design. This relationship to trees is a shared human thread, 
as almost every indigenous culture has a close and reverent relationship to trees, we researched the trees on the memorial sites and discovered that many are immigrant trees, pepper trees, sycamores, ginkgos, and banyans. Each tree has symbolic and practical significance in its various local cultures and came to this land to live among our region's native trees, coast live oaks and California sycamores, which were vital to the many native cultures here, including the Tongva. The canopies of these trees form the protected spaces under which we're placing the elements of our proposal. The primary sites in front of the Chinese American Museum here at the top is located in the first destroyed Chinatown where the Chinese American community of LA first took root. The elements of our proposal are a silvery tree, a pavement timeline, and a petrified grove with sculptural trunks, roots, and stumps, all based on banyans. At the secondary sites, a variety of stump and root markers would be placed under existing trees or newly planted native oaks. The existing trees in front of the museum are Peruvian pepper trees. In South America, they were used in medicines and rituals and emigrated from the Andes to California around 1825. This Andean tree has become so iconic in LA that it's also known as the California pepper tree. Among these existing trees is a younger banyan with a matte metallic smooth bark that in sunlight can glow softly, attracting people to the memorial. A semicircular root embraces it with the inscription, a young silvery tree as a beacon of growth and hope in a grove of trunks, roots, stumps, trees, histories, and memories. We also envision it as a wishing tree, like those revered throughout Asia, such as Hong Kong's Lam Chun wishing trees, where small pieces of paper with wishes are tied to branches. Radiating from the silvery tree are timeline arcs etched into the pavement. They begin at 1565 when the first Asians and Pacific Islanders arrived in the Americas, in Mexico, on Spanish galleons. Next is 1587 when Filipinos arrive in California. The etched timeline continues with many more dates, mostly unknown, marking, for example, the Asians and Pacific Islanders who fought in the Revolutionary and Civil Wars, the Filipino founder of LA, one of 44, or the more than 200 Chinese communities expelled and destroyed in the Western US. At 1871, on the day of the massacre, the timeline widens. Here in a petrified grove, you can walk among stony trunks and information stumps and sit on root benches. All of these sculptural elements could be 3D printed from recycled stone granules. The trunks are older banyans cut down to human heights for the lives that were truncated, 18 upright for the known killed and one felled for the 19 to 24 unknown killed. Each of the 18 names with a, with a brief description of each victim are inscribed on the encircling roots nearest the trunk for each individual. The trunks are meant to be tactile for you to walk up to, move among and touch. Stony stumps throughout the primary sites, along with stump markers at the secondary sites, are places to glean information. These stumps can be supplemented with details and photos on a self-guided tour that can be read or listened to on your phones. Ossified roots, sculpted to rise up from the ground and to burrow back down, remind us of the desires of immigrants to form bonds with the land and the deep histories of immigrant groups that have been often been left unseen. When these roots appear above ground, they become circular benches where you can sit and pause beside a tree under its leaves. The largest of these root benches is engraved with the inscription, a remembering circle for gathering, recollecting, recognizing, honoring. This gathering space is reminiscent of the sacred spaces under large banyans for village rituals and celebrations and Native American talking circles for communicating and healing. This remembering circle can hold community events, such as the annual commemoration of the 1871 massacre. Here is the fell trunk on the left and 
the upright trunks with the museum behind. So now we'll take you through the secondary sites. In locating the secondary sites precisely, we overlaid survey maps from the late 19th century on top of an aerial view of the present day city. Zooming in, here's the primary site. Here's the Coronel Adobe, where three men were shot, and Calle de los Negros. The main road through the first Chinatown where the gunfight erupted that triggered the mobs. We found that the middle of Calle de los Negros ran along the present day east sidewalk of Los Angeles streets, directly opposite the museum. Here we're proposing a stump marker near a canopy of existing, existing banyan trees, forming a connection with the primary site. At Pico House on North Main Street near Dr. Jean Tong's office and residence, where he and housemate Chang Wan were dragged to be hanged, the stump marker would be placed under existing pepper trees. Here's Commercial Street, where three men were hanged from a wagon. And here, where it says carriages and agricultural implements, is the likely location of Gawler's uh, wagon shop, where six men and the teenager Alu were hanged. This dotted line likely indicates the awning from which the lynchings took place. Nearby on Los Angeles Street, where there's a bus stop and two areas already created for tree planting, we're proposing a stump marker and two native oaks. This site is on the corner of the present day Fletcher Bow Run Square, named after the LA mayor who during World War II ordered the internment of Japanese Americans and gave racist speeches on the radio. Up here is the sign marking the square. To locate the site of Tomlinson's corral and lumberyards, where five men were hanged, we compared this photograph of the lumberyard with an 1888 map, locating it at this site, which overlaps with the present day Hall of Justice. The gates from which the men were hanged were likely here in the Hall of Justice's front landscaping where we're proposing a marker in the form of an emerging root under an existing London plane tree. This tree is literally a hybrid of East and West of the Platanus orientalis, native to West Western Asia and Southeast Europe, and the Platanus occidentalis, native to East and Central North America. Ray's vineyard, where Judge Gray hid several people in his cellar, is on present day Broadway between 6th and 7th, it would be indicated by a stump marker under the canopies of two existing banyan trees. The corner of the old city jail compound lies in present day Grand Park, where we're proposing planting a native oak between two root benches. Here you can see city hall in the background. The city jail was where the first victim, Ah Wing, was seized from the police, but also where several people ran to for protection from the mobs and eventually where most of the victim's bodies were taken before they were buried. The old city cemetery where the bodies were temporarily buried in a section set aside for paupers, lynching victims, and Indians who died by violence was located on Fort Hill. This 1875 photograph was taken from Fort Hill and would have been the view of the mourners who buried the victims. It shows the plaza, Calle de los Negros, and in the background, El Aliso, the ancient sycamore that was the heart of the erased Tongva village of Yaanga. El Aliso was a gathering place for village leaders across Southern California, and visible from great lengths as the Tongva calculated distances in relation to it. El Aliso died shortly after LA was settled and was sold for firewood in 1895. In 1957, on the southeast side of Fort Hill, the Fort Moore Pioneer Monument was built to celebrate the capture and settlement of California as an American territory in 1847. The monument was designed between 1947 and 57 by two Japanese American architects, Kazumi Adachi and Daik Nagano, who won the competition. On the site are nine existing ginkgo biloba trees, 
under which we're proposing an emerging root marker, pointing out this layered history. The ginkgo emigrated from East Asia, where it's a symbol of hope and peace. In Japan in particular, it's a symbol of endurance and longevity, as four ginkgos survived the Hiroshima bombing and live to this day. At Union Station, where the second Chinatown was demolished, we're proposing a stump marker under existing native oaks. Union Station replaced the central, the nearby central station, which is one of the sites of the Mexican repatriation of the 1930s, where up to 1.8 million Mexican Americans were deported, even though most were US citizens. It's also important to note that the current US border controls aimed mainly at people crossing from Mexico were originally developed to keep the Chinese out of the US. This wall on the 101 freeway, because it passes below the first Chinatown, is where we're proposing a mural depicting important Asian Americans surrounded by the branches of native oaks. From Civil War Corporal Joseph Pierce to Mary Tape, who desegregated public schools in California, to Vincent Chin, whose murder sparked pan-Asian American activism and strengthened cross-racial solidarity. We want to counter the misperception of perpetual foreignness and show, as with the timeline, that Asian Americans have participated in and contributed to this country since its beginnings. Now we turn to the third Chinatown. Here, in 1938, Anna Mae Wong planted a willow tree. The tree no longer exists, unfortunately. So near the original site, we're proposing a native oak between two root benches to create a new gathering space for the community and to connect to cultural traditions, native environments, and the other sites. In closing, I'll read a condensed version of our project narrative, which will take you through the memorial as if you're walking within the sites yourselves. It's important to us that the memorial is an experience, a series of places you can walk through, possibly sit for a while, and learn from places that are not just looked at, but inhabited. From the freeway, station, plaza, we come upon a grove, a silvery tree, curving roots, stony stumps, and petrified trunks halted in gesture, their branches cut, their lengths shortened, yet standing firmly rooted at human heights, all among a row of leafy trees. A pavement timeline reveals the history of Asian and Pacific Islander Americans, of arrivals, labors, service, settlements, expulsions, exclusions, internments, resilience, innovations, achievements. It begins with the Sylvie tree, a gentle beacon, and continues alongside the museum, then expands at 1871, October 24th, to encompass the petrified grove. The first trunk stands alone at 6.15 p.m., its cut branches reaching skyward. It stands near the widest curling root, which surrounds a remembering circle. And as we sit on this root bench, we, we read the engraved words closest to the trunk. Ah Wing, worked at Pico House Hotel, dragged from policemen, taking him from captors to the city jail, lynched at Tomlinson's Corral. We weave among the other trunks, touch their bark. They huddle tighter as their numbers increase. We read more engraved words on the other curling roots, then we sit on one to absorb all we learn about a people prevented from taking root, the men and boy shot, stabbed, dragged, hanged at seven o'clock, 8.45, nine, 9.30, 18 in all with one last trunk uprooted, fallen, for the unidentified 19 to 24. Then the timeline continues. Looking back, we notice the gestures of terror changing into defiance and strength. From, from Stony Stumps, we learn more about the victims and about Seya, where every village is sheltered by a rear grove and guarded at the entrance by a majestic banyan. Beneath the broad canopy is a protected space 
for burning sticks and paper at stone altars beside roots, for lighting firecrackers, and for gathering under shade, sharing news about relatives abroad. Across Asia, enormous trees are worshiped for their longevity. References to the tree of life pervade global religions. Family tree, moral fiber, and cultural roots are common concepts. Respect for plants, animals, and their interconnectedness with humans is given by indigenous societies. Trees sustain life, as oaks did for the Tongva and El Aliso for Yaanga. While the petrified trunks are older banyans, their lives cut short. The silvery tree is a young banyan with potential to grow, its branches dangling with folded papers and written hopes. A self-guided tour leads us to the secondary sites. At the locations with existing trees, Los Angeles Street banyans, Pico House's pepper trees, Fort Moore's ginkgos, Hall of Justice's London Plains, Broadway's Banyans, and Union Station's Oaks. We read on each stump marker about the significance of each site and hear about related histories, including the transcontinental railroad workers, the destruction of two Chinatowns, the decade of Mexican repatriation, and the Yaanga village. At the other sites, LA Mall, Third Chinatown and Grand Park. We admire the newly planted native oaks and hear about immigrant trees taking root among native trees, sometimes a parallel to the complicated growth of American society. Each memorial site adapts to its location, offers a place to learn and contemplate, and new oaks contribute to LA's goal of planting 90,000 trees. We finally understand that every trunk bench, stump, site, and tree is interconnected by deep roots that have been long buried. On the freeway, a mural emerges with portraits of significant Asian Americans embraced by large oaks. As we return home, we listen to the last segment about their consequential yet mostly overlooked contributions. Materializing ignored contributions and forgotten tragedies in tangible forms is crucial now before more is lost. The recent rise of anti-Asian violence has had a long history. This memorial recognizes that the acceptance of Asians as Americans has been painful and incremental, yet it's a recognition that Asian Americans have been deeply rooted here in the city, state, and country since the earliest days. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. We now have our final presentation, um, and this will be from Fung and Blatt. Okay, um, so we'll get started. Um, I just want to commend Judy and Nicholas for a really thoughtful and um, thorough and informative presentation. And thank you to all who has worked so hard to get us to this point. Um, my name is Alice Fung. I'm principal of Fung and Blatt Architects. And I am Eric Flint. I'm the associate here at Fung and Blatt Architects. We are the dual generational team behind this proposal. Our concept for this proposal grew from our studio's first visit to the site to trace the key places of the 1871 massacre. The experience felt abstract and kind of removed. It begged the questions of how does one connect to an event that happened over a century and a half ago, and when all the sites have been built over and rendered unrecognizable. As we walked along the east facade of the Gagne building, we paused and bent down at intervals to read the small text on the historical information flags along the sidewalk. The gesture of lowering our heads to read resonated with our bodies. It captured the tenor of our journey to trace the erased site of a horrific massacre. Inadvertently, we bowed our heads in respect, in remembrance, and in remorse. Which translates to lifting my head to gaze at the moon, 
lowering my head, I think of home. This couplet is from a classical poem by 8th century Tang poet, Li Bai. My grandfather taught it to me when I was a tiny child. And it's often the first poem to be introduced to Chinese children. Its simple words capture the migrant or an immigrant sentiment at its purest. The upward gaze of hope and aspiration and the downward gaze of remembrance and longing for that left behind. Our concept builds upon the gestural experiences and spatial metaphors in the raising and lowering of one's head and the feeling that they elicit. Each time we hold our heads up high with pride, we also are afforded the reciprocal gesture of lowering our heads in humble acknowledgement of past wrongs. We invite the passerby to pause, to be in another place for a moment in empathy and contemplation. Our proposed intervention consists of two parts. The first part is the focal point of our proposal. It engages the primary site along the sidewalk of Los Angeles Street and into and next to the old firehouse. The second part is layered upon and extends the concept of the first, engages with secondary sites around downtown LA and into the entry court of the Chinese American Museum. There are four key elements in our proposal. An infinity mirror box, which is a metal and glass box consisting of opposing mirrors that gives the illusion of infinite depth. A broken and hollowed out boulder, a field of coal black ingots, and worker stools. Now I'll introduce the first part of our proposal, which is located at the primary site. A broken and hollowed out boulder rises from a sea of black ingot shaped paper bricks. It encases and it's at the same time held in place by an infinity mirror box in a state of mutuality. We're looking at the cross section through the boulder and the infinity box right now. Um, so under a top layer of structural glass, the, the box's walls are illuminated and lined with a pattern of pine wood tablets. The top roll of tablets are inscribed with the identity of the identities of the massacre victims. Um, we include their names and occupations to give them more of a sense of personhood. Um, the wood tablets we call ancestral memorial tablets in village temples. Further down is a one-way mirror and several rolls of blank tablets and bottom, 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 bottom being out at, uh, with another mirror and thus creating the illusion of infinite depth. This infinite pine shaft echoes the depth of Chinese American roots on this land and the magnitude of loss to violence against Asian Americans communities throughout time. The lighting differential between the inside and outside will also affect the reading of this infinity mirror box. Daytime will present the first roll of the tablet and a reflection of the sky and the viewer. At night, the full effect of the tablet line shaft will come to light. The sea of coal black ingots alludes to the multitude of, of immigrant stories untold and the street paved with gold myth that continues to beckon many. It also evokes a nocturnal backdrop for the boulder, which takes its shape from the moon, an almost full waxing gibbous moon on the night of October 24th, 1871. Fissures in the boulder reveals the brass casing of the infinity mirror box. A brass ribbon continues on the ground and becomes the service for narrative information that also reappears at the secondary site. A simplified wooden Chinese worker stool rises from the black ingot pavers. 
inscribed with the name and what biographical information we have of a Chinese man killed near this location in 1871. The stool marks the beginning of the second part of our proposed intervention. This part of our proposed engages four sites around downtown LA where the killing took place and the Chinese American Museum's entry court. Chinese worker stools made from thermally treated pine sits on field of coal black ingots pavers. The worker stools honor the humanity and labor of the early Chinese immigrants. Whether individual or in groupings, the stools occupies the foresight of the massacres. For example, along Main Street, near its intersection with the old commercial street, a group of three stools are placed for Wen Qi, Wang Qing, and Ah Wang, each inscribed with the identity of a life taken, each is an invitation to sit for a moment and to fill an absence, and each a marker to link the spatial narrative of our collective history. We propose for a, a specimen Guangdong white pine to be planted at the Chinese American Museum's entry court. An emblem of immortality, the living pine shares the origins of the lives taken and establishes a material link to the memorial tablets and worker's stools. It grows as a symbol of hope, connecting our past and our future. We rely on the elements in our design to engage the passerby at the sensory, physical, and po poetic levels. We want to invite contemplation, but we also want to allow for personal response, interpretation, and for people to find their own, their connections and meaning. We intend for it to spark curiosity and questions that may lead them into the entry court of the Chinese American Museum and through its doors to discover exib exhibits that contextualizes this event in the larger social political context. This memorial carries the memory of the 18 lives taken in, eight, in the 1871 massacre. It also remembers countless others in the century and a half that follows. We hope it will inspire further creative works, debate and action as we process this event into our collective consciousness. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for the presentation. Sorry, we've been having a lot of difficulty in strategizing around some complicated Zoom bombing situations that are that are happening. So apologies for um, for those distractions. Um, so now we just have a little bit of time, I think, to do some some group questions. If people have questions for all these three presentations, um, feel free to to drop them in the chat or send them to me directly. Um, so we're going to do a little bit of, of group conversation or uh, group questions, and then we'll break out into small groups. Um, so I have a couple um, that I want to throw out there. The first is kind of um, predictably kind of prosaic, <laughs> but I think it's a question that a lot of folks um, might have, um, especially people who are in the implementation side of things. But I just am curious, um, we've heard so much kind of about the poetry of these proposals and the concepts behind them. Um, this question is just about maintenance. Like if you have thoughts about, you know, how, how will these structures um, exist and live in the challenging environment of, um, of downtown Los Angeles? Um, and how do you imagine um, kind of adapting them for, um, for long term sustainability? Um, and I guess if you have a question, um, please um, Put it in the chat, and I'll. And if you have an answer, I will unmute the um, the teams here now as we speak. And maybe if Fung and Blatt wants to go first, since they're already in. Okay. So our proposal, um, at least the for the primary site, the, the main part of the proposal takes up a relatively small footprint. Um, you know, thinking, um, 
regular um, park maintenance of, of washing the sidewalk and and uh, just reg regular maintenance by by um, park um, maintenance team. Um, we actually have the um, design for for the boulder to be sitting on a steel armature so that a, a small portion of it can actually be removed or slide out on metal tracks so that we can actually um, service as we need to the interior of the box um, as needed. Um, the glass is structural glass and we also researched into a self-cleaning glass um, it, that needs to be washed, you know, from, you know, every month or so. Um, that's what we have in mind at this moment. <laughs> Okay, um, Nicholas and Judy, would you like to um, join in? Sure. Um, we uh, we designed the memorial to be as low maintenance as possible, and uh, we chose forms that have been kind of historically tested as being um, forms that are endurable, that are durable, and um, and also materials that are also very um, very durable. Um, these are uh, markers made out of stone. Um, that uh, would need normal maintenance, um, you know, every once in a while. Um, but so uh, we did want them to be very kind of simple, basic forms uh, that, um, you know, would be simple to maintain. And and if necessary, actually, it's possible to put on some anti-graffiti coating on these uh, these sculptures and to at least, um, uh, you know, maintain the surface. Um, and also, as far as the trees are concerned, the, the newly planted trees, um, um, they would require uh, regular watering um, at the beginning until their uh, roots you know, really uh, take root. And then after that, it will be minimal maintenance. Um, so it, it would be the first few years and um, of, of regular watering. And we're kind of hoping that that would actually be something that could unite the community somehow. You know, this uh, regular act of you know, going to these you know, three locations uh, with newly planted trees and and somehow um, you know uh, sort of create these new um, uh, activities and um, uh, you know uh, community type gatherings um, every once in a while. And because they're native trees, um, you know, they need the first few years to get to catch roots, uh, but then after that, because they're adapted to this environment, they wouldn't need uh, the kind of regular maintenance as at the beginning. Wonderful. And then uh, Yi Ying or someone from the first, first team, Ji Yang. Could you also unmute Jia Wei and Sonam as well? Yes, hold on. Yeah, I think I can answer that question. So basically, our project used uh, a lot of red bricks, and this material is really like low maintenance, doesn't require much. So just mm, I think maybe just the annually check introspection is. Uh, is enough. And uh, about the material itself, we were actually considering about using like um, like used used red bricks, or like maybe we can even collaborate with uh, local factories. Like we can have a workshop, like let everybody participate and do their own, like make their own like red bricks. Yeah. Uh, can you unmute Jiawei as well? I think you can unmute yourself now, Jiawe. Right. Okay. Oh, hi. Yeah. 
Yeah, uh, from Slams, uh, I, I want to add a quote from uh, William White, who, write the, uh, who, who wrote the book, The Social Life of Small Urban Spaces. Because uh, we basically use like the very common architecture um, materials all around the US and which is like everyone knows how to maintain it. And another side is like, we, we try to create a space for people to gather in, like trying to be a very, very same civic point in LA. And like uh, from William White, like a, a more a, a space, like if it's more uh, public and uh, like more people to get there, it's much easier to get maintenance and, and uh, it's, it, it, the, the space will be more safety as well. Like in this way, like people gathering here every day and like it, it will be much cleaner than uh, like uh, an isolated point in a like uh, a very edgy area in the town. Like in this way, like we want to like the all the other people get here, like to try to this space clean and uh, comfort to use. Yeah, and that's it. Great, thank you so much. Um, I got a few other kind of more specific. Um, questions about maintenance, but I'm going to pause on those for a second um, and kind of back out to sort of thinking about these as kind of both forms um, and you, many of you touched on these in your proposals, but you know these are forms that are both um, in a sense, you know, sculptural uh, thing that exists to kind of contemplate as itself, but it's, they also kind of form um, in another way, like a social stage or create some spaces for activities. And I thought I'd love to hear a little bit more about your thoughts of how do how do people um, how do you imagine or dream that people might interact with these spaces? Um, how do they um, you know renew them and make them meaningful um, in in coming years? Like what's the what's the way that the public would 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 use these spaces? And I guess with particular reference to like any particular aspects of the design that in, that engenders or enables particular uses. And any order is fine. Um, or I could call on <laughs> folks. <laughs> um, maybe Alice, would you want to go first again? Okay, I'll try. Um, and you can be able to turn on your video. Can I? Give it a try. Oh, there we are. Oops. Almost. I promise I'm not going to Zoom ball you. <laughs> you promise, but then, you know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, we envisioned our um, memorial to be um, we focused on the emotive aspects of, of the elements that we selected. Um, it's a busy intersection and rather than creating additional forms and, and noise, we wanted to have something relatively simple. So we expect a memorial to be attracting the passerby um, for them to pause for a moment and perhaps look into the boulder, perhaps gaze at the black ingots and and kind of around um and develop a sense of curiosity in a way um to to read more about it um there would be some information um written down and and also you know to also draw them into the um a uh chinese american museum um there's also a series of um, worker stools that has the names and bi biographical information of the um, victims of the massacre um, located at this um, the primary site. And also, if we're allowed to develop the secondary sites, we would like to um, create little um, places of respite for people to um, rest for a while. We want the materiality to and textures to speak to the passerby and have them sit down and think about what this place was, um, what is the significance of this bench, this um, seat they're filling, 
and um, kind of, in a way, you know, seduce them into into the into the story and the narrative and the larger narrative that we wanted um, them to explore. Wonderful, um, Nicholas and Judy, would you like to? Um, can you hear me, Nicholas or Judy? Do you have a, a thought on, are you muted? Again, hmm. Oh, um, yeah, apparently a number of people are muted. Um, Eric <laughs> Lynn is also muted, can you? <laughs> okay, I'm trying to unmute you all. <laughs> we didn't realize that if we mute ourselves, we'd be relegated to the kind oh. of, <laughs> <laughs> okay. of participating. Um, but uh, anyway, yeah, we, the, we thought about um, our proposal um, encompassing a whole range of, of use. Um, so as a memorial, we did want it to be both a place that could be um, related to on a very personal level. So um, each of the, the trunks are a, um, a, a human scale so that we kind of see um, and can identify in an emotional way with the gestures of the uh, the trunks. But we also wanted it to be on, on a larger scale uh, as a distributed memorial to be able to encompass the, the history, both at that site, but also the larger histories that overlap in the many sites um, all over Los Angeles. Um, so an, on another kind of range of scales that we wanted uh, people to interact with it is both on the um, the ceremonial, so we have this um, gathering uh, circle uh, for um, events to happen and for people to gather. But also we wanted to work on a, on a quotidian level. So this is the reason why we wanted to have uh, benches that people could sit um, as they're walking, um, you know, for like elderly people who need a place to rest with their groceries um, in various places. That's why we placed uh, one um, sec with the secondary sites in the heart of Chinatown with the benches to create this kind of space for community that would be reminiscent of the spaces in, in Seyo. Um, anyway, would you like to add? Um, and also um, the uh, Petrified Grove, I, um, we were envisioning as just, I mean, even if you were a, a, um, just a passerby, just somebody walking on the sidewalk and you didn't know anything about the a memorial, if you come across it, you just be able to walk right into it and, and just sort of feel perhaps some calm and some curiosity about what 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 it is actually um, it's supposed to represent and, and do. And so, and then we're hoping that the benches themselves are inviting enough for you to, you know, want to just sit down if you have, if you're just walking through, you have some groceries in your hand and you need to rest and you just want to, you know, take a moment, you can do that too. But then also, maybe start, you know, seeing what else is around you, maybe read the timeline and start learning at the same time. And so um, it can be very informal um, from the beginning and then maybe the interest will um, increase and then, and then um, you know, th there'll be, uh, you'll be able to learn more um, every time you pass through. We really wanted to utilize the, the shaded spaces underneath trees um, as, as, a, as a space. Um, shade is really important in, in LA. Um, with the uh, increasing heat. And, um, and actually this kind of goes back to the question about maintenance. Uh, we noticed that the pepper trees which had been going back to the site once in a while. And they noticed that they were trimmed very, very drastically. Um, and actually in our proposal, we would want them to grow, have a chance to grow more yeah. um, and to really kind of cover and, and shade that space. Yeah, I also noticed that about the trees. Um, particularly the ones by our primary site, they are the in, in the worst condition of the whole line of trees that we felt were very important to preserve. Um, and I also noticed that they actually may be perhaps it's because there's more infrastructure um, heights and, and utility lines underneath. Um, I guess the other thing I wanted to add about our proposal is that at a urban site that is relatively you know with a lot of activity you know surrounding you um 
the way that we found space really is to um it's through actually um i guess the infinity mirror box which allows you to to look downwards and and see infinite space and um and also a reflection of the sky depending on what time of the day you're looking at and we felt felt that the the way to create space for contemplation and reflection you know it's actually in this um it's in the boulder great <clears throat> um and is there an answer for that question from uh Ying or Jiao Wei or Sonam. <laughs> yes, um, any of you. I think you can unmute yourselves to speak at this point. Yes, I think I can answer that question. Can I briefly share my screen? <laughs> um, yes, so I guess it's uh, actually a right to an easier question for us to answer because our whole projects was based on the concept of creating a space for for human interactions right so the whole whole point of our concept is to create like possible way for people to in, interact with with each other like we will imagine you can celebrate traditional festivals here or like you can have community gatherings here or you can just like people pass by can simply just sit there or read a book or like hang out kids can hang out with friends you can probably play chess or have lunch at the table here that's that's also the reason why we use you can see since we use the the bricks right so you can see there is different height and different heights of the the steps sometimes it it becomes a bench sometimes it's stairs because I think as uh, as designers they're saying <laughs> we have learned that you will never be able to expect or like uh, or be able to know how the how people will use your space right you might have think about like every possible ways but there will be always there will always be like unexpected ways like how people use this space so that's why i think like the best we can do is to try to provide this space and it will be actually be interesting to say how people will actually like have like they will have uh, understand or they will have a, their own idea like how to use this space yeah thank you thank you all so much for participating in this really rich conversation and hearing these um incredible proposals um i want to thank all of you um for making the time to do this on your Saturday morning. Um, and I especially want to thank these design teams who have given so much of their intelligence and thoughtfulness and spirit and time um, to thinking about um, what this memorial could be. Um, so this is going to conclude the, um, the first half of our day's presentations. Um, for those who um, can make it, I highly encourage you to come back out um, at 2 p.m. to hear the remaining um, three teams. As Kenneth said, you know, we're thrilled and honored to be one of six finalists. This, it's, it's really a wonderful project and we're so happy to be uh, invited to participate. Thank you. Yeah, and it was so great to hear the earlier presentations this morning. Mm -hmm. um, Really, really amazing ideas and also so different. So it's, it's really fun. Great. Um, so, okay. so our proposal uh, for the memorial to the victims of the 1871 LA Chinese massacre centers around a black stone that's in the shape of a mountainous rock. Um, it has a carved raised map of the underworld that I'm going to draw and carve into the rock. And this will be um, with the purpose of guiding lost spirits back to a place of rest. So in Chinese culture, a lot of people believe that if you die far from your native home or if you die a violent death, your ghost is gonna be confused and wander forever looking for its way back home in a place of rest. 
So the spiritual purpose is to guide these potentially disturbed and wandering ghosts from the who are the victims of this massacre to a place of rest, as well as creating a place of memorialization where the lives will be remembered and honored by the living generations to come. Um, the stone is located in primary site number one with historical context and information carved on the back of the stone about the massacre and the 18 individual life stories and the map will be on the front side it'll be canopied by trees and activated by reflections from the sun which i'm going to talk about a little later um, the map takes inspiration from my artistic research into Chinese 19th and 20th century migration histories, Taoist paintings of deities in the underworld, ink drawn maps marking the sites of family graves, and my own experience at the age of 16 and in subsequent years visiting my ancestors' big family grave that's dug into the side of a mountain in the outskirts of Fuzhou on my, um, on my dad's side of the family. The map will be carved in bas relief, so it'll be raised up so that visitors can create an ink rubbing copy of the imagery by placing a piece of paper and rubbing either with a pencil or an ink pad. Um, and we were hoping to find ways to collaborate with the Chinese American National Museum to create different workshops leading people through the process of traditional Chinese ink rubbing as a way to create these kind of interactive events um, and moments to draw people in to visit the memorial, the nearby museum, and related sites. This history of ink rubbings comes from a, a long history in Chinese culture that I got interested in from my teaching. So it was used historically to commemorate important historical events and share scholarly texts. Um, places like the Stele Forest and um, the Taishan Mountain, a sacred mountain that has these historical texts inscribed in the stones as you travel around the pathway are these Chinese cultural sites that exist that are historically places of pilgrimage that also function as what I like to think of as a living archive. Um, so visitors can, in our memorial can create a kind of important copy of this information in the form of an ink rubbing. And that copy of the text then goes out into the world and shares that information much more broadly than that one local location. Um, and so I teach classes at UCLA, both in printmaking and in ceramics, and I really have loved thinking about the long history of how sculpture and um, print are intertwined in the making and circulation of knowledge. And also as a teacher and artist, I've been struck by how some of these histories have been marginalized and that I myself was never taught this particular history in my own education. So. Um, fairly late, um, just like in 2017, 2018, I started researching uh, more details about the history of 19th century Chinese immigrant um, uh, stories and also a lot of learned a lot about the um, restrictive government policies against um, Asian immigrants, Chinese immigrants specifically, and also learned for the first time about horrific acts which um, happened all, all around the US, but which the 1871 LA Chinese massacre is a sad part of. Um, and this research was part of a trilogy of exhibitions I did in 2019 to 2021 that were in New Zealand, the UK and China, where I tried to bring some of what I learned into the public's knowledge as well in sculptural and um, visual forms. So creating a memorial that shares this knowledge is a really important way to acknowledge and also mourn together and also the fact that I really believe in education um, is part of the way that prevent preventing cycles of histories of these kind of moments of violence from repeating themselves is by making sure that this knowledge doesn't get buried and lost. So giving people the chance to interact with this memorial and take a physical rubbing away with them is a way to kind of keep that um, that physicalized and present to people. Um, the stone memorial will be flanked by and canopied by two trees on either side of the stone. And we're hoping to work with a landscape architect or a landscape artist like Dan Ladd, who grafted the tree image in the bottom left, or sorry, bottom right. Um, and um, 
the trees are grafted to grow together into a particular shape. So I want to create a shape that kind of comes together above the stone monolith as a symbol of coming together, healing and unity. And it also has a practical side where it creates a lush canopy that gives a little shade from the sun as visitors visit the memorial and read and touch and interact with it. And this green element is also um, an opportunity to build another connection with the Chinese American Museum. I was really excited to learn that they're working on a new project with the Chinese medicine or herbal medicine garden with living plants that are related to herbal medicine. Um, in my own artistic practice, I've dealt a lot with these histories and like learned a lot about Chinese medicine. And I had created a garden for the Times Museum using herbal medicine plants intertwined with some of the agricultural crops that the 19th century indentured Chinese workers were working on plantations. So this is something that is also a potential place for more interactive workshops or um, activation of the connection between the Chinese American Museum and the memorial site. Um, and then the third element of this um, memorial proposal is that the floor surrounding the memorial is inset with 18 flat polished brass fragments that reflect the light and they represent the 18 victims of the massacre. Um, these polished brass fragments, when grouped together, form the shape of the silhouette of the mountain that is the stone mountain that has the map on it. So it's almost like a brass shadow of the mountain, but it's broken into pieces and scattered around the stone. Um, and this fragmentation alludes to the fragmenting effect that the massacre had on the community. And in this memorial, they're going to be activated and brought together by the sun. So every day, the primary site number one receives full exposure from the sun and from the east for half a day. And the sunlight reflects and bounces off the shiny polished gra brass fragments, creating refractions that spill out on the one hand towards El Pueblo Square and then in the other direction towards the Chinese National Museum. And um, this is part of um, Justina's design of thinking about drawing in pedestrian traffic and getting people intrigued by seeing these reflected lights, not only from walking by, but also um, a lot of cars pass by this busy street. Um, they would see the reflections on the firehouse and the near other nearby buildings and hopefully be curious and spark to come check out what is causing these reflections of light. Um, and so you see, you know, um, our designer of our proposal used axonometric technology to try to plan how these solar reflections um, change over time. And we're hoping to place them in a way so that on the anniversary of the event on October 24th, the sun's rays would cast the light of the reflections onto the center of the stone where the, the map is carved and drawn. Um, and this is something that takes inspiration from uh, Neolithic monuments like Stonehenge or Newgrange monument pictured on the left here, where on the summer solstice or a particular day, the sun aligns with the mound's entrance or like um, the, the place between the two Stonehenge <laughs> uh, stones and um, draws attention to that particular place. In conclusion, um, I just want to recap what I just went over. Our proposal takes the form of this monolith of black stone. It's carved in bas relief with a map that guides wandering spirits of those who were killed in the massacre to a place of rest. Um, this bas relief surface invites visitors to have a tactile as well as visual and learning experience where they get to look, touch, and make ink rubbings to take away from the carved images. And it's surrounded by these 18 small fragments in the reflective brass that represent the 18 lives lost um, and the fragmenting effect that this massacre had on the Chinese community. And lastly, the canopy above will be grafted together to form a symbol um, indicating the healing and coming together and unity that we're trying to create by creating this memorial. Thank you so much. Uh, I look forward to hearing uh, your questions and talking with you in the breakout rooms. Uh, okay much. All right. Um, our next presentation will be from uh, the figure X and J office, uh, James, Jennifer, and J. Um, are you able to um, share? Oh. 
Okay, Lynn. there we go. All right. Awesome. <laughs> okay, let me share, share my screen. screen. Do you see our screen? Yes. Okay, perfect. All right. Um, thank you to the City of LA and LA Department of Cultural Affairs for making it possible for us to be here today uh, to share our work and to have an open conversation about commemorating an important historic event in the Chinese American community. Especially thanks to Felicia Filer of the DCA and Rasen Wu uh, for all of the coordination work and putting it all together. Uh, we're very humbled to be uh, in the great company of other talented finalists. So we wanted to take a moment to introduce ourselves and share our own backgrounds to contextualize how our Chinese American experiences have inflected the ideas of the diaspora community that we bring to the table. So hi, my name is JG. I use they them pronouns. I was born in rural Oklahoma to Taiwanese and Chinese parents and lived in Torrance, Taipei, Chicago, Beijing, and Shanghai before settling on the East Coast where I founded my architectural practice and where I teach architecture and design. Hi everyone, my name is James Lang. Uh, I was born in Guangzhou, China uh, and immigrated to the US at the age of eight to join my parents who left China after the events of Tiananmen Square. I grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area and most recently lived and worked in downtown LA prior to starting an architectural practice with Jennifer in 2018. Hi everyone, my name is Jennifer Lee and I'm a first generation Chinese American, an architect and an educator. My parents were refugees from Vietnam and have roots in Chaozhou, China. James, Jay and I, we all met in school many years ago and have been close friends since. Through our parallel careers, we've all become teachers of architectural design at UC Berkeley and M at MIT. In our teaching and professional practice, we've tried to bring to the surface ideas of cultural identity and community to the built environment. These ongoing conversations between us have led to us collaborate on a series of projects, including this joint proposal. So the horrific events that unfolded throughout October 24th, 1871 in LA, which we now know as the Chinese massacre of 1871, um, in order to fully understand its impact on the Chinese American community, we've had to consider the lead up to, as well as the aftermath of the event. For us, it was the results of a complex entanglement of pressures and causes and effects that still remain difficult to distill simply. So as we thought about how should we commemorate this tragedy as a community, we thought about how our frustration and dismay were not only aimed at the fact that this actually happened, but that we as a team didn't know very much about it until recently as well. And so because the events uh, of this Chinese massacre happened a very distant 150 plus years ago, our collective grieving as a community is not only for the victims of the massacre itself, but a reckoning that some of the same injustices facing Chinese Americans have continued to present day with recent waves of anti-Asian hate. So by looking back at this event in history, our sense of the challenges presently facing us is heightened, as well as our sense of urgency to respond with resistance and resilience. So we believe it's, it's critical that this particular memorial be not only a monument to a past tragedy, but an offering of hope and learning for the present and future of this community. We'd like to acknowledge the Civic Memorial Working Group within the Los Angeles Mayor's Office and their findings in the past due report. The report helped us reconsider the purpose and the form of this memorial, as well as how it can be situated within the broader context of LA's complex history. We were impressed by the report's framing of the contemporary moment as LA is in the midst of unearthing forgotten paved landscapes and histories. We found Christopher Hawthorne's observations on gardens particularly meaningful in the context of memorialization. 
with this passage in particular, quote, because gardens evolve significantly over time and require thoughtful and regular upkeep, neither of which is true for a traditional statue on a pedestal, they also point to the ways, both literally and symbolically, that we must reconnect civic memory with notions of maintenance, fidelity, and care. We wanted to use nature as a way to bridge how we reflect on the past and how we can cultivate growth for the future. And this idea of the garden as memorial really evolved into our design approach. So our memorial proposal is called Penjing. And for us, this represents a conception of the garden through a uniquely Chinese lens. Penjing are often seen as living sculpture or physical poetry and embody a cultural attitude towards sculpture as something existing between man-made and natural landscapes. So our proposal for the memorial consists of two primary components, the pun, which could be seen as the vessel or the outer frame, uh, and the jing, a scene, which represents the idea of the garden and a living memorial at its center. We also looked at Chinese landscape practices, how stone, planting, and view are choreographed to encourage reflection, introspection, and peace. Some of the vocabularies we adopted include the framing of a garden view through an organically shaped opening um, or the roughened stone surfaces that borrow from Chinese scholar stones. So before we delve into the specific details of our own design, it's worth mentioning that the design we're presenting today represents the beginning of a conversation between ourselves, the community, and other stakeholders. There are so many topics that we would love feedback on, such as the precise siting, just how much public space the memorial should claim in order to accommodate events and engagement, uh, the material choice and its robustness against wear, the sustainability of its sourcing, we can go on. But at the end of the day, we would love to hear your thoughts uh, and through this open dialogue, arrive collectively at a final design. The RFI offered two potential locations for the new memorial and a series of secondary sites. As a historic location within the massacre, we chose primary site one for its proximity to Chinatown and the Chinese American Museum. It's also the preferred location by the site selection subcommittee and has been vetted by many stakeholders as the most promising location. The site itself is a small section on a sidewalk along North Los Angeles Street, adjacent to the Plaza Firehouse. It's sandwiched in between the Chinese American Museum's courtyard to the Southwest, El Pueblo Historical Monuments Plaza to the Northeast, and a bike lane to the Southeast. Mm. When we first saw the site, we recognized how incredibly compact and un quietly unassuming it was. Rather than demanding such a sense of monumentality or grandeur, we saw this site as an opportunity to provide ritualized care for daily spaces that lack it. So we positioned the Penjing Memorial in between the two existing Californian Peruvian pepper trees and as close to the firehouse building as possible to allow visitors to circulate around the memorial. Here, the memorial creates a focal point for individuals and groups to learn, converse, and reflect on the event. So this view looking southwest presents our memorial in the foreground and you can see the signage over the entry courtyard of the Chinese American Museum in the background. The outer vessel is a round form that invites visitors to walk around its perimeter and because its perimeter transforms with different moments of reveal, Walking around it, we hope, also fosters the process of understanding the memorial as well as the history surrounding it. There is very deliberately no front or back, but a continuous circle of discovery. And so the memorial itself, we imagine, would be milled from locally sourced limestone with a rougher hewn texture at its base that transitions to a smoother honed surface above this sort of balance between ruggedness and refinement for us suggests a spirit of resilience that we see as both poetic and pragmatic. 
And as we zoom in closer, three organically shaped openings carve through the vessel to reveal an inner void. The fluid openings draw the curious visitor towards the memorial center, where one discovers this void is a sort of physical absence. Sculpted with 18 flutes, each inscribed with the massacre victim's name. This fluted void collectively encircles a garden, which is the heart of the memorial. Mm. The exterior maintains a roughness as both a device for reflection and physical resilience, in contrast to smooth and polished interior flutes. These soft interior edges might catch a ray of morning sun or channel raindrops. As the sun encircles the memorial throughout the day and through the seasons, it's our hope that the play of light and shadow on the garden and flutes would be ever-changing, highlighting and grazing across each inscribed name in turn. As one looks through the gateway of the vessel towards the inner garden and the names encircling it, the memorialized past frames a living present. And perhaps by chance, one might also encounter another and make a moment of connection. The name of the memorial is inscribed on its outer surface in both Chinese and English. At its base, a ring of circular pavers surround the vessel, physically inscribed with a summary of the events before, during, and after the massacre. Inscribed QR code markers on the ground also provide digital access to additional information and historical resources. The thickness of the vessel becomes a place for offerings, also housing an incense holder. Collectively, these subtle details quiet, these subtle details form a quietly defined space as one approaches the memorial. It was important for us that this memorial would facilitate different kinds of interaction and meaning for a diverse group of visitors. And so for us, this really all emerges from the Tachu rituals that occurred in the immediate aftermath of the massacre. And for those who don't know, these were processions and rites of grieving that were both deeply interior to the community itself, but also a deliberate effort to reach out to and engage and educate non-Chinese neighbors. And so this dual role of ritual, both engaging outwards and nurturing inwards is something that we really took to heart and feel is particularly relevant in the present moment with the rise in Asian hate. Um, and so the material and form of our proposal are in some ways quite familiar to a broad audience as memorial, stone, monolithic, inscribed with text, but we also sought to integrate familiarly Chinese ways of seeing, Chinese ways of reflecting, grieving, and gathering. And we hope that non-Chinese and Chinese community members may then see and learn from each other. We also look to the precedent of wayside shrines in many East Asian contexts, Taiwan and Hong Kong, for instance, to imagine a format in which, in which ritual, offering, and awareness of history are woven into the everyday urban life in a way that is informal yet full of care. We hope that this work on a generational level to produce a bridge between first, second, and th or third generation immigrants in conveying these cultural practices. Building off this idea of our memorial as a bridge between cultures, communities, and generations, we think this framework will allow for new layers of discovered history and community input to be added over time. So in thinking through the legacy of the Tachu ceremonies that impress us so deeply, we turn to Chinese scrolls and landscape painting to imagine a new procession through the sites of the massacre. In this horizontal scroll, we imagine the various ways in which the memorial can be used and cared for, along with an expanded network of memorials at historically relevant sites. The network would be linked by a walking trail punctuated by QR codes and digital overlays. So I'll walk you through the scroll in a little bit more detail. Um, here on the left, we see the stone being sourced and sculpted and delivered to the main site. Um, 
And then we see the vessel being shown in two scenarios. Um, on the left side of it, there is represented a flower garland beside a standing figure, and that shows a potential anniversary of the massacre, along with seating for a small audience that might be for a lecture, a performance, an event. Um, and next to it, on the right side of the vessel, we see the inner garden being maintained or installed. And then finally, over on the right side of the screen, uh, we're showing the city hall site where many Chinese sought refuge during the massacre. And in this case, the vessel of our proposal lowers to become a circular bench around a grassy knoll. In this case, we show it planted with chrysanthemums um, in reference to Chinese traditions of grieving and in parallel to the park just beyond. And we really hope that in this case, this sort of lowering produces a space for seated reflection. Um, here in the second half of the scroll, you'll see on the left side, pedestrians following the historic walking trail to the Merced Theater site, which is connected to Dr. Jean Tong, one of the massacre victims. And at this location, the memorial condenses into a column shrine with a niche for a small punjing. And here we show the column encircled by an augmented reality kind of educational overlay that could provide more details of the massacre, but might also be a continued subject of community input as well. Uh, and finally, on the right side of the image is the Broadway and 7th Street site, which is the former location of Gray's Vineyard, where many Chinese found sanctuary during the massacre. And so taken all together, we feel it's really important to embed these memorials within the urban fabric, marking places of significance and allowing them to become part of the daily fabric and rhythm of life. And here we're trying to show memorialization as it might be built into very dense urban contexts in particular at the Broadway and 7th Street site where a ground plaque might typically go, but we're trying to reimagine it in a way that is more dignified, more visually prominent, and still allow for the installation of a small offering, punjing, or sculpture. We see remembrance as a constant and ongoing act rather than something sacred and unchanging. So we imagine the garden within the memorial to be a space and scene to be designed and renewed by its surrounding community. By making a living landscape, the memorial itself, the act of remembering also becomes one of care and maintenance, inviting active and physical engagement. This care takes the form of ongoing stewardship, which we think includes the passing of knowledge from older to younger generations as seen in this rendering. And so even though in uh, our presentation, we're showing a penjing in the garden, we want the type of garden to be decided by Chinese Angelinos. We hope that it may become a representation of all of us in dialogue with the frame of the past, which we've designed in stone around it. The penjing may be a garden, it may be a shrine, and our installation, it could be defiantly delicate and green, or resilient and cast in bronze. And we hope that this will change over time. Perhaps when vulnerable, the community may place a resilient sculpture within the memorial. During a festival or anniversary, maybe garlands or arrangement, or a gentle planting in defiance of Asian hate. And so we really imagine that the true memorial or the true memorial project would be a celebration of ongoing care and maintenance as an opportunity to physically bring community, community members together to plant, water, and garden, and in the process, provide opportunities for discussion and dialogue, much like today's event. We really hope to empower Los Angeles's Chinese Americans and beyond to choose our own representation in dialogue with the present and past, and that our proposal might serve not as a monument, but as a vessel for building of community. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, I'm now going to ask um, the final team, 
uh, Formation Association in collaboration with NC Koi and Jujia to present. I think. Oh, there we go. Okay. <laughs> oh, wow. All right. Hey, Rustin, can you <laughs> hear me? Right. Rustin, can you hear me? Okay. <laughs> Um, we're, we're probably just a few blocks uh, away from you here at Mandarin Plaza. I'm here with Zhu uh, Jia Zhu. Um, we're in downtown, of course, Chinatown, uh, LA. You can see downtown skyline in the backdrop. And of course, uh, welcome to uh, Freeze Week, which is happening uh, right now uh, here in LA. I know a lot of people are uh, part of the um, some of the activities there in terms of the cultural scene. Yeah, yeah. And uh, Anna is unfortunately not able to join us to tell you a little bit more about that. But um, you know, here in Chinatown, of course, if I want to grab some uh, Chinese food, amazing, fantastic Chinese food, I just go down here on Broadway, walk up and down the streets here, amazing eateries. Um, and if I want to get uh, fresh uh, bok choy, I walk down Broadway. Um, there are older um, Chinese vendors and multi-generational shops where I can pick up so many of anything I want. But uh, one of the things is that if I want to learn more about uh, Chinese American history, or if I want to learn about the events of 1871, I can't do that here. I need to go to a Chinese American museum. And if I look around here at this site, I can't see it. So come on, Zuja, let's go. We're going to go inside the office here to get a little better situated. Uh, welcome to the offices of Formation Association here. Uh, I'm just going to get uh, set up here. Sorry for the uh, tech technical uh, rigmarole that we're going through here. But um, let me get this plugged in for us. Uh, uh, so, of course, um, thanks so much for joining us, and it's really amazing to hear the other uh, presentations uh, that have been going on this morning, and of course, in the earlier parts of uh, this afternoon. Uh, we just really appreciate uh, being in this space uh, with you all. Um, uh, figure, JG, awesome, respect, props, Candice. Fred Fisher, I mean, these are amazing people. Uh, it's so, so great to be in this company um, and just been learning a lot from you guys um, as, as we kind of meditate our, on our own project here. Um, so of course, uh, good afternoon. And this is a Dajia Hao. Dajia Hao. You know, uh, we are, um, of course, uh, our team is comprised of uh, Anna Suhoi, uh, sculptor and educator uh, here in LA. Zhu Jia, who's a pioneering video artist from uh, Beijing and also my architecture from Formation Association here in Chinatown. We're also joined by Arab uh, Engineering uh, to bring you the Memorial Colonnade uh, for the Chinese victims of 1871, uh, our project. So we're sorry that uh, Anna can't be able to join uh, us today. Uh, she happens to be, because of all the uh, Freeze Week energy happening here, she happens to be presently performing at the Cal Arts Red Cart Theater, uh, Red Cat Theater, um, and uh, she's in a performance called uh, FAC Extra Retreat, which is a studio art pedagogy theme performance by a temporal grouping of seven Asian American artist educators based in LA that's happening now. In the meantime, if you're in LA for Freeze Week, uh, definitely check out Zuja's amazing contribution to the group show, Cruel Youth Diary at the Hammer Museum, uh, Chinese photography and video from the Howden Child uh, collection. Uh, all that's happening uh, right now. And I think, Zuja, your show goes up. It's like up for a little while. Yeah, until right. the May 14th. Until May 14th. OK, right on. So definitely check that out. OK, now uh, a couple of formal uh, thank yous uh, here. So grateful to the city of LA, Department of Cultural Affairs, for producing this meaningful democratic competition approach. And also uh, the call for a world-class memorial for the Chinese uh, victims of 1871. Um, regardless of who wins, we need that here uh, in LA. We're grateful to the steering committee, to the Chinese American Museum, of course, and to the Civic Memory Working Group and their production of the past due report um, from which so much of this uh, recent conversation emerges. Okay, so let me get into a screen share mode here. Give me one second. 
Now I pulled this up. And I think Ross and I'm gonna be okay here, I suppose, doing this screen share. Let's see, are you guys seeing my screen here? Yes. Okay, awesome. Thank you. So um, with all of um, the recitals out of the way, without further ado, I wanna uh, kind of just dig into um, our uh, proposal, invite you to explore the um, memorial uh, colonnade a little further here. I appreciate that. Um, uh, is the screen share up? The screen share went, seemed to go down. Let's try that again. Thanks for the lowdown. Are we are we up again? Yep. Cool, great. So um, just getting into this here, I, I appreciate that you know, a lot of the audience has maybe seen, you know, a lot of the boards. Um, some people we've talked to have really studied them, so we really appreciate the attention, but also um, our ongoing collective cultural um, reckoning uh, with the history of uh, October 14. Uh, 24, sorry, 1871. So against the backdrop of contemporary anti-Asian hate crimes, the Memorial Colonnade is a proposal to decisively foreground a deeply problematic history, historical injustices to the early Chinese American community and simultaneously create a very visible uh, platform to elevate the Asian American and Pacific Islander communities uh, in uh, Los Angeles. I'd like to uh, start the this presentation, you know, you know as, with, as other presenters have done, discussing at least the uh, the site, uh, primary site one, uh, just across from the Plaza Firehouse, and also primary site two. Um, these represented to our team what we would describe as sites of concern. We were very concerned that um, despite uh, two hundred fifty thousand dollars being put into um, mounting the effort and the conversation of this uh, memorial to the victims of 1871 Chinese massacre, uh, that the sites seem to be constrained, that the sites seemed to be limited. And this is paired with the current challenge of, I believe, the Chinese American Museum itself. Why is the Chinese American Museum here in this place, apart from its historical placement in the forgotten and buried history of Calle de los Negros? Why is it here? It's not in Chinatown. It is not in Montre Park or in San Gabriel Valley, where much of the Chinese community lives that could support this guardian of the 1871 uh, narrative. That's one of the um, salient uh, reasons that we decided that um, we wanted to expand the sense of this site, not only for the memorial itself, but we see the sister pairing, the important parallel development of the Chinese American Museum itself, uh, as well as in more expanded notions uh, of a potential site. And when we talk about expanded site, expanded field, we also think about Rosalind Krauss, um, who talked about sculpture in an expanded field. And uh, for those of you who are art geeks and nerd out on that kind of stuff, we really wanted to see this uh, proposal as a framework to not only tackle the buried history, but to tackle the site itself in a meaningful urban way. We detected that the sites were limited and constrained by other municipal forces that aren't being talked about maybe in the brief. There are agency uh, and also interdepartmental energies that are framing um, the environment here. Uh, a close look at these are just snapshots of 
uh, diagrams of the underground municipal infrastructure complicating uh, and defining the site. And these are pulled from the uh, Navigate LA of the city's Bureau of Engineering, uh, GIS. And so, and many of you guys have seen, uh, you know, on uh, other web outlets and whatnot in the DCA uh, website, the presentation itself, um, we see it as a flexible memorial, as a form of urban acupuncture, resensitizing uh, the history of the site, but also resensitizing the social potential of a space that is essentially designed for vehiculars. Uh, infrastructure and automob uh, automobiles, an aerial of the site, and the position of the Chinese American Museum, uncomfortably around the corner of the El Pueblo Historic Monument, the living museum, uh, so to speak. And I appreciate that um, oftentimes events that happen at the Chinese American Museum sort of have to um, find their way around uh, this corner um, and uh, having an inability to be able to be represented uh, within the plaza um, uh, of the significant um, central node of the El Pueblo. Instead, the Chinese American Museum suffers from a issue of where is its entrance on the one hand? Is it off the alley? Is it in the courtyard? Where is it seen uh, from the uh, actual El Pueblo for visitors who come and may or may not find the Chinese American Museum itself, even if they're looking for it? At the same time, we also detect this uh, curious perhaps unintentional landscaping that has been uh, framing the site uh, for many, uh, many years, the pepper trees, the um, crescent alley of ficuses, framing what? A freeway entrance, a street parking lot where you can pay $15 to visit El Pueblo and walk across the street. Let's get on the ground here. Um, looking south at um, down um, Los Angeles and seeing City uh, Hall in the backdrop, uh, again, this vast multi lane, multi modal uh, infrastructure uh, with very little uh, space uh, for um, the pedestrians or people. Our proposal um, is really to create a urban locus, a space that charges with urban significance once you enter. Uh, I'm gonna have Anna Suhoi, um, who is, I'm gonna try this video, who will present this to us. And let me know if you guys can hear her. Okay, I can kind of read it, but we really wanted like Anna to, to, to be present, uh, so to speak. So um, I'm gonna give it a go. The Memorial Colonnade for the Chinese Victims of 1871 proposes a dynamic memorial, a placemaking locus operating both as a large scale sculpture and a platform for community events and activism. To address the complexities of this transformative placemaking, our proposal is strategically flexible in order to meaningfully coordinate public space and municipal operations. The Memorial Colonnade activates an expanded site via an organic and flowing placement of 18 memorial stuff connected overhead by a flying cord, which frames the broad perimeter of the city block. And let's move on into this, the next uh, slide here. Well, Anna will unpack this uh, uh, a little bit more. This perimeter holds not only the heavens and skyline, but also creates an urban public space for gatherings, celebrations, and activism. It is a perimeter that welcomes and holds people and reminds us 
that the possibility of gathering is ever present. We need to be in community and we need to be in communication. Future generations of Angelinos must understand that the events of 1871 should never happen again. Amen. Amen to that. Um, is this an appropriate memorial? That's maybe one of the questions we ask the public. Um, what is the memorial? What should it do? Is this an appropriate expression? Is it appropriate for people to gather on the street to commemorate these events, to take over, reclaim from vehicular traffic, from municipal parking lots, um, to commemorate an event so dark and so untold uh, that we really need to amass to create a counter leverage or a counter fulcrum um, that gathers people together. And part of the goal here, of course, is to gather more people together than hanged 18 Chinese residents on the night of October 24, 1871. Could we produce 500 people that would come and stand in solidarity with the Chinese American commu community to memorialize that day? Could we get a thousand people to come together to commemorate the lives of these 18? Could we, is it appropriate? This perimeter- I'm gonna move into the next uh, slide here. Let's come back down um, onto Los Angeles Street and, and kind of break down the components uh, of this proposal because there's a few layers of things going on that I want to uh, point out to the public and to everybody as we discuss this. Um, that the, the, the site itself in its current state is inconsiderate of human traffic, of uh, pedestrian and uh, walkability. So part of the interest here is what we're doing is to extend the sidewalk, uh, a simple, um, basically, uh, Bureau of Engineering B permit exercise, a little bit of civil engineering will do to elevate um, not only the sidewalk to create landscaping potential, uh, but also to get bicycles off the street in this very critical place where cars are entering the 101 uh, freeway. On this new plinth, on this extended sidewalk uh, apron, on this new better proportioned um, sidewalk space or potentially new plaza space in front of the Chinese American Museum, we place 18 Memorial Stella, uh, which describe a chronological narrative of the events of 1871, on top of which is, is essentially framed by a perimeter flying cord, uh, which Anna described, um, that not only frames the heavens, frames the sky, but somehow brings in its urban environment into the conversation, somehow brings in City Hall into this conversation, somehow puts a node or a marker on what might be the location of not only this site of the historic Calle de los Negros, but the placement of the Chinese American Museum. Here where the sidewalk, this extended uh, plinth, bicycles can move across this and more easily um, cyclists can get off their bikes to explore um, this new landscape, this new intervention and, and, and wonder what this is. What is this sculptural intervention that is happening in the city? Um, it may be discovered that there is a narrative component and maybe much like a comic book, panel by panel, column by column, Stella by Stella, one might discover there is a narrative being unfolded and that is the narrative of the events of the night. Each Stella demonstrates an, an event significant of the night of uh, October 24, 1871, starting with the gunfight, which essentially was a 
Asian on Asian um, violence um, that was happening, that is still happening today, and that produces a, a kind of visual, the flying cord that is basically two distinct um, strands, maybe describing two Chinese communities uh, in a struggle, sometimes in unison, sometimes coming apart in dissonance overhead. The stella can be seen crossing the street as you follow the line of this flying cord perimeter. At night, this is across the street, the Morel Colonnade is lit with light wells from below, as well as the existing crescent of ficus trees, framing a new urban space uh, at night. The narrative unfolds again, Stella by Stella. Uh, as you walk its perimeter, it encourages you to walk, to touch. The surface of the Stella is comprised of a metallurgical electro-deposited metallic surface, which gives it a touchability, something that you want to touch and feel, but something that is quite resistant to vandalism. Uh, artwork has not fared well uh, on the street. Uh, further down south, beyond the 101, or right over the 101 freeway, there is artwork that has been vandalized. And so this, uh, all of this would be comprised of steel that is embedded uh, onto this column. QR codes also embedded um, thereupon bring visitors to a digital network of uh, ongoing scholarship uh, and demonstrate the network of seven, uh, the secondary sites um, through technology, uh, bringing you to the other locations. Here, one of the secondary sites uh, shown across the street um, from City Hall is placed next to the curb so that bicyclists can come by and be able to see this. This is a multimodal uh, memorial potentially that activates a new motor memory uh, for the city uh, of Los Angeles as we become a more multimodal uh, city. Uh, back to the site, these kind of fallen uh, st uh, Stella uh, basically convey more information about the events um, and the context of 1871. And these specific ones in, right here in front of the Chinese American Museum bear the names of the 18 Chinese victims that were killed uh, on that night. And above them, of course- John, you're, you are at time, so uh, if we could try to wrap up. So yes, can... absolutely. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, yeah, so, what, so the, you know, one of the questions is what is this cord? Is it a mountain? Is it a lasso? Is there a noose? Is it a electricity? I've heard uh, some say. Is this a lightning rod? What it is, is a line that not only creates an abstract, um, but also figurative um, uh, sculptural potential um, for everybody who sees it and allows it to be many things to many people. But what it does do is frame the site in a very visible way, but also elevates the, um, the memorial in a way that is seen through the city and potentially elevating the community of not only Asian Americans, but specifically Chinese American activists and future uh, proponents um, who will also bear the narrative of the Chinese victims of 1871. With that, I'll end uh, the presentation and back to you, Rostin. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to all these teams. Um, incredible presentations, so much to think about. Um, so as a reminder of our format, um, I'm gonna ask a few questions I'll give each team a chance to kind of respond to them, but really we want to devote the, the, the chunk of the time, the majority of the, of the time we have left um, to the small group conversations um, amongst the 60-some the folks we have gathered here today. Um, but I'll start off with a few questions that I think I know will come up, so I'll just try to get some of them out of the way. So the first one, as with the first session, um, is very kind of prosaic, but I think necessary is just what is, um, if we could talk 
in, in as much detail as possible about sort of the, the plan for maintenance and stewardship. How, how will these things be protected and stewarded um, in public space? Um, as we all know, um, things in public space in Los Angeles, I'll go ahead and say maybe in particular in Los Angeles, um, have, have rough lives. Um, how will we keep these, these spaces um, functioning and working, working as, we, as we hope them to be? Um, and maybe we can answer um, in order of uh, the presentation. So I don't know if um, the first team is able to unmute. Yeah. Let me find Candice. Okay. No. Um, yeah, maybe David and Justina can also be unmuted because they- um, Yeah, absolutely experience than me with the practical side of these things, but um, we did choose our materials, the stone, um, uh, for ease of maintenance. Um, David, do you want to say more? Yes, I... Um, and David, sorry, you should be able to share a video. Let's see. Uh, every time I say I, I hit start video, it says I'm disabled. Oh. Same with um, one But I... I I, I could just answer the question. Um, as you can see from our proposal, there's stone, there's polished brass. Um, I think when materials were thought about and selected, we tried to understand that maintenance could be a factor. Um, and so we wanted to use materials that we felt um, could stand the test of time, so to speak. Um, so we, we think it's durable. Um, in the event there's graffiti at some point there are anti-graffiti anti coatings that could be applied if needed on the stone or surfaces um but I, I i would just say that our our submission is um I, I can't say it's maintenance free but i would i would uh anticipate it's low maintenance oh i can start my video now i guess sorry oh, i don't know what happened there you go sorry there you are Sorry about that. No worries. So for our scheme, we did think about weathering and wear quite a bit. And that was a large part of why we thought about scholar stones, which are these objects that are in the process of, let's say, erosion or in the process of becoming. And we sort of position those rougher surfaces closer to the ground as sort of as, as something that we thought was beautiful, but also would ease maintenance. That sort of like, there is this rough surface that can be continually sort of renewed in many ways, but- I'll Well, I mean, um, yeah, I mean, we'll keep this yeah. casual. Um, I guess like we keep thinking about how the issue of maintenance is always tackled in a kind of reactive way. Um, and, and we found ourselves trying to think about how we can think about maintenance differently uh almost like short circuited and i i think that you know part part of the idea or central to the to our idea of a living memorial is that maintenance is central and through that maintenance comes opportunities for gathering um for nurturing and so you know i i don't know if that means that we, um, as a part of the conceiving of the budget of the memorial, that there is an endowment, um, but but very certainly that um, maintaining it, programming uh, the maintenance of it, those are central. So so it become you know it really becomes this thing that is proactive. Yeah, and I I think that for us that program these opportunities to bring community physically together, we want that to extend into the future and not have a moment where the memorial which we really see our proposal as a series of vessels or frames for the memorial network itself, which is activity, which is people planting and gathering. So we we have talked about one option being this endowment or trust that is a sort of, is the memorial organization. And that can continue to bring people together in discourse, in dialogue, to continue to represent the community over time. Thank you. John, do you want to tackle this one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that, um, it, it's a, it's a tough, it's a tough uh, question. 
I mean, the site itself is super rough. Um, we've wow. definitely tried to take a look at other public artworks that exist on this very street, uh, just to see the state they're in after you know uh, many years of having been installed. And one of the things that really um, concerned us, um, I mean, similar, Ross, to what you're saying, it, it, it's a tough place. I, I wish that um, we lived in a, a much more uh, civilized Los Angeles. Um, I, I really do. I mean, I, I really, and I also, um, you know, so that, well, on one hand, there's that. On the other hand, I really want to say sorry for the first group of presenters when the Zoom bomb showed up. That was just insane. Even now, while we're trying to, um, you know, highlight uh, Asian American narratives, there is a counter narrative that's coming against it. There's still violence being done to Asian bodies. There will be violence done to this uh, memorial, whatever it is. That that was a, a real concern. That how do you create something that can overcome that, uh, but also you know be maintained? And so and so we we took the approach that. We, we're there, there's a big part of it that is up in the air that is in the sky that is untouchable that you really cannot mess with and so it continues to speak its message regardless of how embattered it becomes uh at the pedestrian level but at the same time um you know in the presentation we we're just talking about the idea of this metallurgical um surface uh, it was to to try to come up with something that you'd want to touch uh, you know, um, to differentiate it from street lamps and munif municipal like infrastructure, but something that that was sculptural and felt like you know the the, the surface of a Giacometti or something. Um, and so we found this technology that is called uh, electro spark deposition, in which metal is sprayed onto and melting on metal, so that becomes this hardcore surface, and then is painted. And the reality is it, the, the public artwork that exists on the street is painted in the end. The street lamps are painted up to six feet. Every street lamp on the street is painted. And so we just swallowed the tough pill and said, this, this memorial will need to be painted. And the maintenance protocol is basically a paint protocol. Um, and so we, we wanted to grapple it with, with, in that way. Hopefully that answers the question. Absolutely. Um, great. So the next question, um, it follows kind of from some of the things that, that you all said, and you all touched on this, I think in, in some detailed ways in the presentations, but I want to kind of just zoom in on this piece, which is, you know, how do these, um, I don't know, these spaces that you're creating, um, how are they going to engender activities? Like if we imagine sort of like, what does the, um, how does the memorial speak? How is it, um, activated? How do people, you know, in your dream version of like, what are the events that actually keep this um, memory and the meaning of it um, alive and in touch with, you know, the current situation? How do you imagine the memorial kind of uh, creating or engendering different kinds of activities? And I guess in particular, if you could sort of talk about, um, you know, specific activities you imagine happening there and also sort of like the why and the the who of those, um, who's going to be convening, how do, how do they convene there? Do you have you know, obviously, you you know, you will not be able to control that. But in your in your fantasy of, of that space, how does it how does it operate? Um, and we can go in the same same order, or any order, really. Um, I feel like I talked about that a little in my presentation. We were really thinking about how do we find ways to have kind of public engagement. Our earlier proposal had an actually had a more elaborate like station for the ink rubbing. Um, which we ended up taking out because of some of the um, feedback we got, but it it's um, it is a form of engagement that can be really simple with just a pencil and paper, like people do on Vietnam Memorial or other memorials, um, kind of on their own, uh, or it could be something um, stewarded by an organization or partnering with the Chinese American National Museum to. Um, make it more elaborate and to teach the more Chinese cultural aspects of this um, medium and the the history and significance behind it. Um, so that was one idea for public engagement. And they also talked about maybe talking, bringing in more ways of having workshops relating to the plants and the kind of plant histories. Um, do you guys want to add anything, Stina and David? 
Um, I also think because uh, um, Candice also um, pointed this out in the presentation, I think by having this um, memorial in this location kind of bring some of the pedestrian traffic into the area and into the sidewalk and eventually into the Chinese museum, which I think is very important for the area, which is kind of onto the side of all the other historical buildings um, around there. So I think it will be great to have something like that. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, we, you know, it's someone brought it up earlier, which it's it's difficult to we can only project how we would like people to use it. Um, and in this way, the memorial and how it's situated on the sidewalk really becomes it could be a destination for tourist groups or, or community groups to come through and gain more insight on the event and the broader histories uh, that relate to it. Um, it could become a backdrop for larger commemoration events that are related to it. Um, but it's also kind of a, a quiet, you know, presence on the street. So if you're just walking through, you know, coming home from school or getting groceries, it becomes kind of a moment for pause to discover something that's somewhat different um, within the sort of pedestrian landscape of LA. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're trying to give flexibility in that um, sort of the quietness, the, the backdrop, but also it becomes a focal point in other regards. And maybe I can add to that. I think that we also very much see our vessels as frames for the memorial, as we had said. And within those frames, we've attempted to build in a range of touch points for, let's say, legibility or engagement that range from the culturally and, mm -hmm. and very specific to Chinese culture to those of that are more broadly understood within a memorial context. And we hope that this provides a bridge not only between the Chinese and non-Chinese communities, but between generations as well, in which there are oftentimes quite different degrees of connection with traditional Chinese spatial, cultural, or grieving practice. And so as this object, you know, I think that in one of our images, we showed children coming up to it. I think it is this engaging device that might spark curiosity to look within to the planting, but also somebody who's older or maybe a, a direct immigrant would immediately understand how to offer incense and immediately understand the importance of possibly chrysanthemums if those are what's in it at the time. I'll just quickly add that that's kind of inherent in the way that the the memorial shaped as well it, it is a it's a layered form a layered space so you can appreciate the outer perimeter but uh, you know it it really truly invites you to discover or to uh move uh closer and and look inside and and through that process you you are you know whether you're circling it or you're sort of moving closer to it, you're discovering things about the history, about the memorial. So in that sense, um, I think uh, this thing invites you to spend more time there. Yeah. And as one example, the interior flutes of the sort of void are actually modeled after lobed celadons. And so we're trying to produce a series of entry points and sort of like footholds. Thank you. And we're talking about dreaming here, right, Rostin? Sure. <laughs> um, do, do you mind if I do a, just a quick sh uh, share screen here? Sure. On the, uh, I just wanted to bring up the the last image, and it's, I'm trying to get it to happen, but for some reason it's not. Um, I can also. Oh well, there you go. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, I mean, I mean, in terms of like our, our wildest dreams, Rostin. Is that what we're talking about here? Yeah. Okay. All right then. Uh, I mean, it, it, what there's maybe like I'll I'll mention three things. Say, one is that um, that if literally every year on the anniversary of the of um, you know 1871. As I mentioned in the presentation, if, if at least 500 people could gather here um, to commemorate the event, but this space will hold more than 500. We did a 
a little bit of a count uh, based on LAPD's uh, definition of a crowd, how many people you can get in here, like a crowd, a crowd. Uh, and maybe maybe the LAP would have to kind of break this up, but um, you can get like 10,000 people in this space standing shoulder to shoulder. If you could do that, then you would create a pretty significant countervailing fulcrum uh, for the Chinese American community standing in solidarity. I mean, if we get that many people standing in solidarity with these 18 Stella, I mean, that would be like a beautiful dream. That'd be just an amazing thing if every year that many people could get together and say, we're standing with the Chinese American community. So number one, number two is I hope, you know, I would hope that this project becomes a sister programming space for the Chinese American Museum. But not only that, put the Chinese American Museum on the map. So when I say Chinese American Museum, people don't say, where? Oh, in Chinatown? Oh, wh where is it? If people don't know where, we want the guardian of this narrative to be put on the map in a way, and maybe this is my third, this is my third wish, so that when, when you look up in the sky, there may, there may be a Chinese weather balloon up above looking down on this, and they know where this is. <laughs> And, and they could say, look, here's a city, here's a city that is so civilized, that is so emotionally mature, that they can acknowledge the wrong done to these Chinese people. Can't we? Can't we? Back to you. That would be awesome. <laughs> Thank you, John. Okay. Um, well, I think that as many questions as I have, I think all the people in this room probably have even more, and I'd love to give them a chance to voice their thoughts, their questions, their concerns. Um, one thing that we're trying to do, sort of unusual format, is I actually asked the designers um, to submit questions that they had to the audience. Um, and so I'm gonna read out um, a few of those questions, and they'll also be posted in the chat room um, of your breakout group, but, um, uh, but I'm gonna read them out we're out now. <laughs> um, so the first one is this. Um, the project brief indicated fairly precise boundaries for the recommended site of the memorial. We're sensitive to the reality that claiming more space beyond the site boundaries may present greater cost and logistical difficulties, but we also realize that memorials often require the dignity of a more extensive surroundings. So we'd like to ask the community, how much space do you feel um, is important to reclaim for the memorial within each site for seating or gathering or any other number of activities that allow for productive community engagement with the memorial. Um, and there's uh, five more from another team. Um, ideally, what do you think this memorial should bring to the community? What kind of value should be offered? Third, what does the memorial mean to you as individuals and to the community? And three, do you think that what we're doing here, designing this memorial, is critical to the community 160 years after it happened? And if so, why is it important? Fourth, what's your favorite public space to hang out with family or friends in the neighborhood? What kind of factors make it your favorite spot? Five, if we'll be designing the sidewalk in front of the Chinese American Museum together, what kind of facilities or functions would you want to bring into that space? And lastly, how often do you take a walk? Do you enjoy walking in the neighborhood? Why or why not? And then I have six from one other team, and then we'll move on to the, the breakout rooms. Um, one, which memorials or public artworks do you like and why? Which Asian Americans or events in Asian American history are important to you? How did you learn about the 1871 massacre? Did you know about other moments or events in Asian American history that might not be widely known outside the community? Are there outdoor gathering spaces in Chinatown that are important to and frequently used by you or the, by the community? And are there particular places or spaces in LA that make you feel particularly rooted as an Asian American? Okay, well, that's obviously a ton for you all to chew on. Um, and by all means, answer any of those questions that um, pique your interest, um, but also you know, voice any, any thoughts that you have. I'm about to break us out into, I think, four rooms. Um, there's also a pretty substantial group of people who's gathered here in this space in real life um, at NAC Architecture. Um, and they'll be joining sort of a hybrid space as well. Um, I'm going to enable uh, you to uh, turn on your cameras and I encourage you to do so and also unmute yourselves. I encourage you to do so. We have many moderators standing by to um, eject um, 
eject Zoom bombers. So um, hopefully that won't, won't be an issue um, when I open these rooms. So I'm about to do so. Um, and here we go. And then we'll reconvene after about uh, 30 minutes in there. I just want to say <laughs> thank you all to everyone who came devoting their afternoon to this um, effort. Um, it's really wonderful to see so many people so deeply engaged with this subject. And especially I want to thank um, these three teams and really all six teams um, for the commitment and the intelligence and the thoughtfulness and really the time that they've spent and devoted to, to imagining with us. Um, a note about the process going forward, I think we mentioned this a few times, but this event was really a, a meant to be a moment for those designers to share their designs with the public um, and then hear back from the public you know, what they thought so that they can revise them. Um, and improve them and think through you know, potential problems, potential opportunities, and build something really special. So they'll be taking everything they've heard, we'll be recording everything from the chat rooms and from the larger group conversations and delivering that to them. And they'll submit final designs in about a month to a jury um, that will then finally pick a winning team that will work with the city, um, with DCA, and with the uh, 1871 Memorial Committee to make this a reality, which will be, I think, a, a true, um, a true asset to our city and something that I'm incredibly grateful to even have this very small um, part in. Um, so with that, I want to thank you and um, wish you a good afternoon.